George Wilhelm Hegel, or as Hegel as he's called by philosophers. He was born in 1770 and he died in 1831. And he represents the culmination of a great philosophical movement called German idealism. So let me just give you a little uh, outline of the history of philosophy. So during the Enlightenment, which began with Descartes as the father of modern philosophy, there was a movement called continental rationalism. And the three great thinkers of that tradition, and there are others, was Rene Descartes, Leibniz, and Spinoza. That's called continental rationalism. Now, uh, also in England and the UK, there was another movement that emphasized empirical experience. And that movement came to be called British empiricism. And John Locke, Berkeley, and David Hume are the three great thinkers of that tradition. In Germany, there was this truly uh, great thinker, Immanuel Kant, and philosophers have all respected Kant so much. He's one of the, they're all great thinkers, but Kant like uh, emerged as one of the foremost thinkers. He attempted to synthesize the both both the empirical movement and British empiricism and continental rationalism and his philosophy <clears throat> is the beginnings then of a great movement called German idealism and there are other philosophers that came after him as part of that tradition of idealism Fichte and Schelling and it culminates in Hegel. Uh, I was lucky uh, when I was studying uh, doing my doctoral work at Penn State University. Penn State was um, no, ranked like third in the world in philosophy. And they were known for their emphasis on continental philosophy. And some of the best um, Hegel scholars were there. And then they would get people from Europe to give lectures on Hegel for us. And my teacher, Joseph Flay, was a great Hegel scholar. And he was my teacher. Uh, this is an interesting little uh, tidbit of information. Joe Flay, who passed away some time ago, um, was a great man and a great scholar, a good man. And um, he, was work, he worked on a book on Hegel for 27 years, one book, which was a commentary on one book that Hegel wrote called The Phenomenology of Spirit. And we'll talk about that today. And of course, he, he had to include the best secondary literature in French and German and English. And um, so that was noteworthy. And I remember taking the course on the phenomenology with Joe Flay, and we didn't get through the whole book. And then I took uh, a individual course by arrangement with him to finish the book and um, with him. And uh, so it brings back good memories. Hegel, uh, as far as I know, um, has never been taught at Walsh University in my uh, 24 years that, that I've been working here. And um, I think it's because, uh, well, no one's ever taught Hegel, but it's because his philosophy is notoriously difficult. It may be uh, intelligible only perhaps, you know, to doctoral, for a doctoral, candidates and at a doctoral level. But uh, it was in, it's included in, uh, I wanted to include it because although Hegel's philosophy is notoriously difficult to understand, all philosophy is difficult, but Hegel's even more difficult. And there are reasons for that we don't need to go into. But at the same time, Hegel's philosophy is very significant. Um, his philosophy gave birth to many movements that came out of him, especially the whole history uh, especially Marxism on the left, uh, even fascism on the right. Uh, Kierkegaard, um, who's a very important um, Christian existentialist, um, studied ne uh, Hegel very carefully and had a criticism of Hegel. And he's, he's very influential. He creates this system and the deduction to the absolute standpoint, as he calls it, to create his system is this book called The Phenomenologia des Geistes, 
the phenomenology of spirit. Sometimes Geist is translated as mind. I think spirit is a better translation. But generally speaking, <clears throat> so he has this whole system that uh, explains everything. And all philosophers, most philosophers do create a system. Some philosophers are against systems. They don't believe in systems. There are very few, but most of them, especially during this uh, movement, during the enlightenment, um, these philosophers all created their own system. By a system, they, I mean a philosophy that includes everything. So Hegel's system um, differs from most other systems insofar as it emphasizes process, movement. Uh, unlike most other philosophical systems that separate unchanging being from nothingness, there's usually, if you study the history of metaphysics, which is the study of reality, you'll always find this separation between being, which is unchanging and identical with itself and static, and nothingness. And that separation between being and nothingness leads most philosophers to separate reality, which is unchanging being, from mere appearance, which is this world of this flow of movement that we find ourselves in, in the world that we inhabit. So there's always a dichotomy, not always, but for the most part. The history of philosophy, Western philosophy, um, can be characterized by a difference between reality, which is usually whatever is unchanging, and mere appearance, which is whatever is changing. But we find ourselves in a world of change, this flow of becoming. This is the world that we inhabit. <clears throat> so this is called metaphysical dualism. And we saw it very clearly in Plato, for example, where the ideas are more real than the sensible particular. Why? Because they're unchanging or in Descartes. So, but not just Plato and Descartes, uh, it's just about every, it's in Kant, it's in just about every philosopher with few exceptions. So what makes Hegel different from those is that he merges, he believes that being and nothingness are combined. If you combine being with nothingness, then you have becoming. So, this sets Hegel's philosophy apart from most others in that he wants to create a science of becoming, okay? And lo and behold, that's the world that we have our, that we inhabit. So this admixture is becoming. So he departs from traditional philosophy and this led Hegel to develop an entirely different kind of logic also, which is based on the dialectics of becoming. Now dialectics has a long history, going back all the way to Socrates. For Socrates and Plato, dialectic meant philosophical conversation in search of a definition of these ultimate ideas that, are, that were unchanging. But Hegel develops the dialectic in his own way. Now there are other philosophers after Hegel too, who use dialectics like Karl Marx, who we're going to study also. But his dialectic will be different. Again, we always have to take words and return it to who said it and the context in which he or she says it. So dialectics will mean something different for Plato, something different for uh, Hegel, something different for uh, Marx and others. So what does Hegel mean by dialectics? Dialectics is the, the motor, the power that moves everything. It moves nature, it moves thinking, it moves everything, it moves history. By the way, I didn't talk about Hegel's works, um, but he, he has a philosophy of history, he has volumes on logic, he has a book called The Philosophy of Right. It's an incredible system. I, I, you can't overestimate how awesome this system is. Awesome in the sense that it's fully developed and it in, 
it embraces everything. Um, so, the book, though, that became most famous by Hegel, and perhaps the one of the most interesting one, is what most philosophers call uh, his deduction to the absolute standpoint. He's going to make his way to a position where then he can develop his positive philosophy. So his most influence, influential work is called The Phenomenology of Spirit and it was published in 1807. It's a manual, monumental work, and it's, it's called Phenomenology because it demonstrates how absolute spirit, which is God, experiences phenomena in an advent from its most rudimentary form of consciousness. So Hegel starts like with the lowest level of consciousness that there can be like the beginnings of life, even like the grass or um, wherever life begins, there's some kind of consciousness there. It's not self-consciousness. It has no reason yet, but there's some kind of self-awareness. Have you ever noticed like even in plants, like if you take a plant and you put it near the sun, it will turn into the sun, right? So there has to be some kind of consciousness going on, but it's not human consciousness, not even animal consciousness, but it's alive and it's responding to its environment. And there must be some kind of internal awareness going on there, but it's surely not self-conscious, doesn't know it's a plant. It's not animal conscious, not human consciousness and nothing beyond that, right? So he starts at that basic level consciousness, the most rudimentary form of consciousness. And he works his way up through various ascending forms of consciousness till finally it reaches part two of the book, which is called self-consciousness. So now consciousness becomes aware of itself. This is the part I want to concentrate on with you. And then it moves beyond, and, and it moves through dialectical uh, phases of that to a, a level of, of reason. And everything shifts gears, the channel changes. It becomes aware of itself. He starts thinking historically and re reason in history and so on. And then it moves even higher than that into in various forms of reason. And then it moves even higher than that into spirit, different forms of spirit until finally it makes its way to theology. And then beyond theology is his view of philosophy. So it goes from the love of wisdom to a science of wisdom. He wants to actually move beyond philosophy known as this, the love of wisdom where you're trying to get to wisdom to actually a science of wisdom. So it goes from consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, and spirit. But it's absolute spirit unfolding by way of this dialectic. So each moment of the dialectic creates a thesis. Every time there's a thesis, that's a position, a particular worldview. Weltschauung, a worldview. And then it thinks it's at the absolute standpoint. Have you ever noticed how people all think they, they've reached the absolute standpoint? Even a little ant walking across the sidewalk, it thinks it's God. I mean, it doesn't think it's God, but it, it's reached the absolute standpoint. Everybody thinks they've reached the absolute standpoint in knowing, but they haven't. And then they learn they haven't. How do they learn they haven't? What happens is they come across an antithesis, something that negates it's just the opposite of who they are. And there's a struggle. So the dialectic moves this way. There's a thesis where some life form assumes the absolute standpoint. It thinks it's at the absolute standpoint. And then it encounters its negation. So thesis, then negation. And then out of this struggle, there's a sublation, a transcendence, and it moves into a higher and more complex life form. So it moves by way of thesis, antithesis, and then synthesis. 
And then that synthesis encounters its negation. And then there's this negation. So preservation, negation, sublation. Okay. Or some people say thesis, antithesis, synthesis. But the word, actually, the word is aufgehoben in German, which means uh, preservation, it preserves, negation, and then transcendence or sublation, which means transcendence. And then again, preservation, negation, Transcendence. So in each, each time the dialectic moves, something is preserved but from its standpoint, but something is negated. And out of that negation comes a new, what, what came to be called sublation. That's a fancy philosophical word. It means transcendence. So you're, you're going beyond where you were before. And then it gets more complex, a little higher. And he takes it all the way. This is what's so monumental and so uh, awesome about this work. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's really uh, an incredible book. Um, it's one of those big, hard books of philosophy. Um, and so he believes that he's showing the movement, how absolute spirit begins with consciousness and it goes through this dialectical movement until um, it reaches finally absolute knowing, the absolute standpoint. And so that's God knowing himself throughout all of his transformations. And of course, not everybody reaches that point. People get stuck somewhere along the way. So what makes Hegel's phenomenology of spirit and all of his other works different from the other great thinkers who make up this movement of German idealism, such as Immanuel Kant, Johann Gottlieb Fichte and Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schilling. These are the big names in the history of German idealism. Is his demonstration of how concepts are not static. See, for all those other philosophers and everyone that came before him too, including the ancient Greeks, everyone, the concepts are static. You know, the ideas don't change. But for Hegel, there's something that, uh, that remains the same, but the concepts change. So they're constantly being recast. And so he ad adds this element of process. They're not static entities for Hegel, but structures that undergo ascending transformations by virtue of this driving force called dialectic, the aufgehoben that I've just been talking about, preservation, negation, sublation or thesis, antithesis, synthesis. And at each stage in its development of absolute spirit, experience what he calls the we, which he wants the, there's this person like, or well, it, be, before you get to uh, conscious, self-consciousness, really not even a person. See Hegel, what makes Hegel's philosophy sort of difficult to understand is he speaks, he wants to speak generally so that he can include, so that things change as it unfolds. So he, you don't know if it's a person or if it's history or he's speaking psychologically or politically. He, he speaks in such a way that it includes all of that, okay? And you, you have to sort of sh shift gears as it's moving. So before you get to like self-consciousness, not even a person yet, it's like plants and animals. And then when you get past self-consciousness, he's speaking about history. And then he's speaking, you know, uh, in, in much more universal levels. So you have to sort of shift gears as you move with the dialectic. So the German word is aufgehoben for dialectic. And that's the driving force. That's everything moves that way. Nature, history, the mind, everything moves by way of dialectic. At each stage in its development then, the development of absolute spirit. Experience moves from a certain standpoint, which at first it assumes to be absolute, to its experience of another that represents the negation of itself at that stage of its development. Out of this struggle with its other, it then moves beyond itself to a higher synthesis, only to repeat the process all over again. 
At each of these stages, it believes that it has reached the absolute standpoint, but finds that it has not. This dialectical struggle of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or what I like to say, um, preservation, negation, sublation, it continues until it reaches the final synthesis, what he calls absolute spirit. Okay, so I'm repeating myself, but the idea is uh, abysmal, and that's, that's the big idea of the phenomenology of spirit. So it's completely impossible to go over this book, you know, in such a class. Maybe even in a seminar, we could, someone could get through the course if it moved at a good pace and the course lasted 15 weeks. Probably the way to do it would be two courses, two seminars, and do half the book, you know, in one semester and half the book in the next semester. That would probably be the most legitimate way. But there's one passage that is included in the anthology that I'm having you use. And it was included because it's one of the most influential and noteworthy passages of Hegel's phenomenology. Um, it's the section called Independence and Dependence of Self-Consciousness. Independence and Dependence of Self-Consciousness, colon, Relations of Master and Servant, okay? or some people call master and slave. Now, the German really doesn't say master and slave. It really speaks metaphorically like a lord and a servant um, that was taken from medieval talks, but he doesn't mean it that way either. Uh, perhaps the best translation would be masterhood and servitude. The state of being a master and the state of being a servant. Okay, and he wants to include any form of mastery, not any form of mastery, but many forms of mastery and many forms of servitude. So slavery um, would be something that it would include. Like for example, in before the civil war in our country and in Europe, um, who ended slavery like a hundred years or 150 years before the United States. But when there was slavery, or even in slavery in ancient in the ancient world, it would include that. But it would also include like um, the exploitation of the poor by the rich in an extreme capitalist state, for example. Um, so he wants any form of mastery over any form where there's a master dominating another class of people. It could be uh, men over women, white people over black people, rich over poor, uh, European over indigenous peoples. It could include all that. So Hegel describes how the first form of self-consciousness emerges in this section from what he calls naive consciousness. So this is the beginnings of self-consciousness, okay? It's, remember I told you the book moves from consciousness, self-consciousness, reason, and spirit. And in between, there are all these permutations in between. So I just want to talk about um, this section with you. And what I'm going to do, I think my role would be to put this into plain English, because I do want you to read it. Don't not read it. I mean, read it. And it's uh, you're going to you're going to just want to throw yourself on the floor. It depends how how hard you want to understand it. But even for a seasoned philosopher like myself, and who studied Hegel from some of the best scholars in the world on Hegel at Penn State, um, it's abysmally difficult to read. But something will seep in, and if you if you do the reading, I would read it after you listen to my talk. Um, then. Uh, it, some of it will seep in. I'm going to try to bend all of my efforts to taking what I think are the key aspects of this section and put it into plain English for you. If you listen to this uh, talk and then do the reading, enough will seep in that you'll understand it well enough. So the important section from Hegel's phenomenology 
has been influential from Marxist to fascist, from the extreme left to the extreme right. Uh, Marxist because of its emphasis on work, labor, uh, which um, we'll talk more about when we study Marx. And um, to the alt-right, it, it, it influenced fascism also um, because of his sense of death and because of the implications that this discussion uh, can have on the power of war over the individual and the dominance of the state over the individual. So um, people have taken up this passage from the far left to the far right and everything in, in between. I told you it's, it's the most memorable. Once you read it with some kind of concern to understand what, what you're reading, it's, it's unforget, uh, unforgettable. And it's, it has been very influential. So Hegel is showing in this section then um, how self-consciousness arises for the first time as the synthesis ensuing between a struggle, masters confronting servants and servants confronting masters. So he's going to show how this struggle makes possible the appearance of self-consciousness. And what's so masterful about this discussion this Hegel's discussion is that he's doing, a per, he's doing it from perspectives. He's showing um, how the master views the servant and how the servant views the master. But there's going to be a kind of coming together of the two. And out of that coming together, there's going to be this emergence of a new form of consciousness which becomes conscious of itself, if it's of its own identity for the first time. And he calls it self-consciousness. It's unclear to me whether it, it happens from the side of the master or from the side of the servant, but it's neither side is probably the answer. It's the, it's the awareness that arises from the master confronting the servant and the servant confronting the master but the, it ends up coming about out of this negation of the master's position vis-a-vis -vis the servant. Something's preserved, some masterhood is preserved, but it moves into a higher level. But that higher level is not the end of the dialectic. It, it ends up what he calls skepticism and stoicism which we won't go into, but it's the beginnings then of a philosophical consciousness. So Hegel's discussion of the dialectical struggle that generates self-consciousness begins with a general discussion of the viewpoints of both sides, of both parties, master on the one hand and servant on the other. Each recognizes the other by acknowledging the other as a force to be reckoned with. So he, he, he's setting this all up about acknowledgement. The master acknowledges the servant and the servant is forced to acknowledge the master. Now in this mutual acknowledgement, this is where this dialectical struggle is going to take place. And initially each seeks the death of the other. The other becomes like the enemy. Because both master and servant engage in the risk of self-sacrifice, since there's no common ground on which they can live their lives, the situation is quite perilous. But as Hegel says, it is only through st uh, staking one's life that freedom is won. So this is a big idea that with the emergence of self-consciousness comes also the emergence of a certain kind of freedom. Hegel claims that this struggle between master and servant can result in one of three outcomes. One scenario would be that an individual may shy away from the struggle, like the servant may say, well, then I'll just acquiesce and be a good slave. Whether it's slavery or being a good worker, making a little bit more money for the CEOs, and I'm just going from check to check, uh, 
or I'm just going to allow men to dominate women, whatever. Just don't engage in the struggle. That's one thing, one scenario. Such a person, Hegel points out, may indeed be recognized as a person, but I quote, he has not attained to the truth of this recognition. So it's not a fully developed human being. This person, in quotation marks, would then command no genuine respect because it's a fragment of a human being, because they don't engage in the struggle. A second result is that an individual may simply die in the struggle. That may happen too, and many have during and after and before the Civil War, for example, in our country. or in battle. As such, he would then become one of the honored dead, as for instance, a black man hung by the Ku Klux Klan, or a labor union protester killed by someone from the alt-right. It's one of these hate groups that is growing ramp rampantly in, in our country, unfortunately. But Hegel points out, the point is not to die but to survive the struggle. The third possibility, and this is the one he focuses on, is to survive the struggle. So he's gonna concentrate on this. This is the one that will take, uh, take us to self-consciousness. To engage in the struggle, but to survive the struggle and to learn the lesson of freedom. It is this final outcome that Hegel focuses on and his description of the advent of consciousness to self-consciousness. Now it's well known that war involves individuals risking their own selves on behalf of something that, of something that surpasses um, their individual selves. You know, that's the truly amazing thing about going to war. What is this something more that people risk their very lives for is nothing other than freedom for Hegel. But freedom is not the only basis of war in political life. It's also the basis of social activism and social disruption. When the drive to self risk for the sake of freedom does not have the outlet, the outlet of war, it creates the conditions of war in order to attain its freedom, like protests. This is also relevant for our times, especially with the protests going on, the Black Lives Matter protests. That, that's a perfect example of what Hegel's talking about. In fact, focus on those two things because what I want to do after this is to follow Hegel's influence in two directions. One, in the form of the critique of capitalism that was launched by Karl Marx and taken up by Marxism and then indirectly, even when Marx is not mentioned, any critique that is deep of capitalism, it finds itself rooted in Marxism. Not Soviet distortion of Marxism and not the, the silly distortions of Marxism that we find ignorance of Marxism that we find in, in most um, Republicans, not Republicans in, in general, but the oligarchy that's taken over the Republican Party now. That notion of socialism and Marxism, that has nothing to do with what Marx taught. There, there's two things that went on with Marx. One is Soviet distortion and communist dis distortion, especially in the Soviet Union. And the second is Western ignorance. So one influence that Hegel had and was Marxism and the critique, Any, anything that's radical left. And radical doesn't have to mean something negative either. In my mind, when I hear the word radical, I think going to the roots of things, what the word means. But then um, also, in, uh, for example, the, the movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, or the civil rights movement that now permeated into the 
Black Lives Matter movement. Um, that too. So I want to take it into those two directions. So in both cases then, political war or social protest, the point Hegel makes is to sur survive the risk. The idea is not to become a martyr and to die risking yourself. The idea is to, to make the risk and survive the risk. So the idea, uh, the reason I'm emphasizing that is because he Hegel emphasizes it and the notion of cunning, that in order to survive the risk, one needs to be cunning. So if the struggle of the self to risk its own being in order to become itself is not drawn up into war, but manages to take place within a relatively stable social framework, then one way it may survive the risk is through philosophical reflection. Like the liberated prisoner in Plato's allegory of the cave, who returns to the cave of delusion and bondage in order to become the occasion for the liberation of his fellow prisoners. But as Plato shows, he must be very cunning in order to survive there. By the time Plato wrote that famous passage in the Republic, the allegory of the cave, you know Socrates was already executed in 399 BC. And Plato even makes an allusion, which is quite specific in the allegory of the cave, when he says, when the liberated prisoner comes back down into the cave and risks everything for the sake of the liberation of his fellow prisoners, if the, pris if the other prisoners could get their hands free, they would kill the man who tries to set them free. And if they begin to, and if this prisoner begins to discuss justice in courts of law, where only the shadows of justice were understood, they would, this person would become a laughing stock. See what, what Plato is saying that he has Socrates in mind because Plato was actually there in the courtroom when Socrates was defending himself in, try, in, in court and he was found then guilty and he had to drink hemlock and he was executed. So he has Socrates in mind there. But unlike Socrates, what Plato is suggesting and what Hegel is underscoring is that the idea is not to become a martyr, the idea is to survive the struggle. So how are we gonna make the changes and at the same time survive the struggle? It's only through cunning. And I think it calls to mind my favorite political philosopher, Niccolo Machiavelli, who said, one needs to be like a lion and a fox. A lion is powerful, the king of the jungle. The fox is cunning. So powerful and cunning. So I'm emphasizing this notion of cunning. And the cunning comes through philosophical awareness. And what I find that's not been emphasized enough by the secondary literature on this passage from Hegel is this notion of that self-consciousness brings with it the rise of a philosophical consciousness, skepticism and stoicism, which we won't go into, but philosophy arises out of the emergence of self-consciousness. So Hegel shows how the master is for a long time allowed to dominate the servant. The servant assumes the cloak of servitude to the master, pretends to be ser servile. This is the cunning that I'm talking about. So this is part of the cunning of the servant to wear the cloak of servitude. Enjoying his dominance, the master comes to believe that he can live off the products that the servant produces for his livelihood and enjoyment. Like, let's just think about men dominating women for so long and how long it took just for women's suffrage. So who, who gains from that? Who gains when more money is given to men for the same job as women do? 
who gains from that? Well, men do, right? Or if the alt, if the rich exploit the workers, who gains from that? The rich. So, as the master revels and consumes the products that are made for his consumption and his enjoyment, he passes by what he, what he should have been keenly aware of, namely, the threat of insurrection. And he fails to experience fear. And the master also Um, has no desire for freedom. He thinks that he's already gained freedom. On the side of the servant, on the contrary, the servant is quite aware of fear. As Hegel writes, for this consciousness has been fearful, not of this or that particular thing, or just at odd moments, but its whole being has been seized by dread. So the German word is angst. And in my mind, dread is more ubiquitous. It's bigger than fear. Fear is something that is, may harm you. It's something that may harm you. Dread is this ubiquitous nothingness that dissolves everything into meaninglessness. It's, it's much more uh, widespread. So this long-standing angst in the servant builds in him a growing desire for freedom. This is big, you know, this building of the desire to be free. And it develops a sense of freedom in the servant that the master has nowhere of at all. Because the only way to long for freedom is to not be free, but the master thinks they're free. Again, back to Plato's allegory of the cave, the prisoners, they think they're free. That's why Plato has the prisoners be prisoners from an early life. They think they're free, but in fact, they're chained. So this long standing angst in the servant builds this, this burgeoning, this growing desire for freedom this desire for freedom is not a yearning for the promised land for Hegel existing in some other better world beyond this world, uh, but rather the hope to one day be free here and now, free at last. Just remember like Martin Luther King's great speech, I have a dream speech, free at last. I had a dream. He wasn't talking about the beyond in the sense of a metaphysical place that one might go when they die, but here, free at last, here and now on earth. So this desire to be free is something that arises only in someone who longs for freedom and has been denied, denied freedom from, for a very long time. And the servant also, has seen something else that the master has not seen. He's aware that things can suddenly reverse themselves, that things can be different, and the master is oblivious to this. So knowing this, the servant allows the master to continue in his false sense of reality. Well, she develops a tragic sense of existence. The servant's long experience of angst has conditioned in the servant an awareness of the nothingness, of the meaninglessness of the master, that I am not your slave. That's not who I am. All the while, the master continues to depend on the servant for all the things the servant creates through their, his or her labor. Now we're getting to labor, which is a key notion. Even though the master may experience a certain uneasiness 
about, about his dependency on the servant, the master knows that I need these things. I need cotton. I need uh, whatever the workers are making. But he's incapable of dread and does not possess any internal desire to be free, for he still believes that his superiority of the servant and his enjoying of the fruit of, of the servant's labor is enough. So the solution to the whole thing for Hegel, and this only comes at, towards the end of the section after, is, is work, Arbeit in German, work. Work is the liberating power. And that's what attracted uh, Karl Marx uh, and uh, others. Even there's, a, there's a, an encyclical written by Pope John Paul II on labor. And since I had studied Marx and Hegel and I read this encyclical, I, I taught a seminar here with my colleague Professor Torma, who just um, retired, and we did a we did a uh, course together for the honors program on labor. And one of the readings was by Pope John Paul II. And since I had read Hegel and Marx, and I I knew their understanding of labor, which is, by the way, um, I'll talk about this at length. is is one of those ideas that completely transformed me in life for the better. You know, some ideas, uh, I, we talked about this with Plato, some ideas you read them and you're still the same person, you, you learn something, but you're, st you're still the same person after you've understood it. But there are other ideas when you understand them deeply, you become a different person, better person. You're completely transformed. And this idea of labor that uh, Marx takes from Hegel and develops it completely transformed my life for the better. Uh, it made actually, I would go so far as to say that it made my, my life worthwhile and, and um, a life worthy of repeating itself uh, eternally. Um, and that's Marx's idea of the difference between alienated labor and free labor. It comes right out of Hegel. But let's stick to Hegel now and not move into Marx and let's just see, how is it that work is the liberating power of the servant? So the servant comes to realize that his identity is not defined by his position vis-a-vis -vis the master. I'm not your, that's not who I am. You may think that's who I am, your slave, but that's not who I am. He comes to realize that it's his work it's what he does. That's who I am. I am what I do. I'm the one who makes these things. I make philosophy, for example. Someone else makes um, something else. Now, if what you do really is who you are, if what you produce is an expression of who you are, then what you do is who you are. So he finds his identity in his work, in his activity. It doesn't have to be making philosophy, making anything. The master, on the other hand, still believes that he is who he is insofar as he's not a servant. You know, the white supremacists, for example, thinks their identity is based on not being a person of color. So their identity is based on not being somebody else. Their identity is based on somebody else. But the, lib the servant doesn't think that they are who they are in the eyes of the master. The master thinks they are who they are because they're not servants. You see, they don't have an understanding of their own identity. Their identity is based on the other and not being the other. It's a negative notion of their own self. So this is the big difference. Now the dread that the servant has for a long time endured 
has been built in, has built into him an awareness of how his freedom is based on his work. This takes him beyond the master's acknowledgement of him as a servant. That's what I've been just saying. It's through work or labor that the servant becomes self-conscious. He becomes conscious of himself as a creator. You know, when I was reading, this is Pope John Paul and not Hegel, but Pope John Paul was saying in that encyclical I mentioned, which uh, that God is a creator. He's a maker. He makes the world. And so Pope John Paul was saying that when humans engage in free labor, not alienated labor, that's going to be an important distinction, but in free labor where what you're producing is an expression of who you are and where your activity belongs to you and so on. We'll talk about that later. Then we're acting in the image of God because God is a maker. So when we make things, we're acting in the image of God. We're creating. Like now I'm creating this lecture for better or worse. It's not the best in the world probably, but it's doing the job. I'm trying my best to take this very difficult passage, make it intelligible for you and share my own enthusiasm for it. And so I'm making this. This is who I am. This is where I find my freedom. Not in being somebody else's slave. So through work then, the servant becomes self-conscious. She becomes conscious of herself as a creator, a maker, as someone who is what she does. So the servant realizes that her freedom is in her own hands. And here I'm using the, hand, the word, I'm trying to play with the word hands because usually the hand is a symbol for work. So rather than choosing to give up the struggle, which would be one of the outcomes, which many take actually, when they say, well, I'm, I'm not going to, um, I don't talk about politics or religion, or I'm not, I'm going to be apolitical and, you know, okay, that's one, one response to what's going on in the world, but it's not going to make any changes. Or the other is to become master oneself. The servant has survived the long struggle. And with the cunning of a fox has realized his self-identity and freedom comes through work, through free labor. So a kind of philosophical attitude is thereby born in the being of the servant. This philosophical attitude lies in his realization that unlike the master, his identity is not bound up with his being a servant to the master or a master who dominates a servant, but in the freedom to create himself through his work. You know, if you think about it, like I think of, there's a passage by the great painter Cezanne, the great impressionist painter. He says, I need to, I need to take it further. I need to go further. When, when, when artists, for example, talk about taking their art further, where are they going? When a craftsman is making guitars, for example, a luthier makes fine classical guitars, and they want to take it further, refine their craft, where are they going? They're going to their own identity as a maker. They're refining themselves. They're becoming more aware of themselves as a creator because what they make is an expression of who they are. And as they refine their skills in making and producing, they become aware of who they are. And in the products they make, the products are a reflection of who they are. Like if there were Martians that came here from outer space and they ask you, you're like, they want to know about these humans. Who are you, you people? Well, if you wanted them to know who we are, you would take them 
and show them what we made. We made these cities, we made philosophy, we make art, we make literature, we make technology. This is what we made. And, this, and then they would get a sense of who we are because those things express who we are. So the dialectic does not end here. And uh, we're only entering into the early stages of Hegel's cavalry to the, uh, he, that's his word, by the way. It's kind of a, a struggle like Christ carrying the cross. Cavalry to absolute spirit. The next stage Hegel titles Stoicism and Skepticism. Stoicism and Skepticism were two great schools of thought in ancient Greece and Rome. And they were philosophical schools of thought. So um, I'm emphasizing the, the, the beginnings of philosophical awareness in this awareness of freedom that takes place here. For even though consciousness has attained its self-identity and a certain kind of freedom, not complete freedom yet, through work, and even though it has begun a kind of philosophical thinking about the freedom it has attained through work, it is still a long way from gaining its full freedom and its full awareness. It's got to go all the way through the various other forms of self-consciousness, of reason, uh, and then finally uh, into absolute spirit. And finally, um, this dialectical journey that Hegel describes in the phenomenology of spirit will culminate in the penultimate, the, the one right before the end, the penultimate section of spirit, which is his discussion of theology. And Hegel, uh, that was his background, uh, theology. And then finally, he places philosophy above theology. Um, its final standpoint is discussion of philosophy. But like I said at the beginning, Hegel claims that his phenomenology of spirit shows the way from the love of wisdom to a science of wisdom. So instead of being a desire, a yearning for the sophon, for wisdom, he claims that he's reached the absolute standpoint, God knowing himself throughout all of the various forms of transformation that lead to absolute spirit knowing itself. But it's not, I remember the last le lecture that Professor Joe Flay gave on Hegel when he was talking about absolute spirit, he says it's not a complete resolution, even when you reach the point of absolute spirit. There's a, there's a kind of uh, dissonance there, a kind of tension. And I, I, when I was listening, because I'm a practitioner of music to a certain degree, however much I can get to it myself, and a lover of music, I think about musical dissonance without dissonant tones in music, it would be quite boring if all the notes of a melody were part of the diatonic, for example, and not outside, then it would be quite boring. It's those outside notes, outside the diatonic, as they call, you know, ba 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 ba. Any note outside of that uh, is, is called an accidental. And composers put those notes there, you know, um, Coltrane, the great jazz, uh, player called those the pretty notes. Those notes make things in interesting. So um, when there's musical dissonance, there's also consonance and dissonance that it makes for uh, an interesting uh, musical feeling. So when uh, Professor Flay was speaking of this absolute spirit at the end of his uh, course on Hegel's phenomenology, uh, he said that it's not a complete resolution at the end. It's, there's, a, there's a dissonance there, like a musical, I was thinking musical dissonance when he was talking. So those are the key ideas. And I was emphasizing some things that I found important, um, like the importance of cunning, like the importance of um, uh, the emergence of, philosoph of philosophical attitude here. I emphasize some things um, that I think need to be emphasized that haven't been emphasized in the secondary literature. And um, 
as far as I know, this is like the first lecture. I've never taught Hegel either. I was asked to do it and I thought um, it's a lot of work actually. That was part of the reason I didn't do it. But the other part was it, it may be just um, inappropriate for undergraduate level. But um, this section I think is appropriate and I did my best to try to put it into ordinary English language. If you listen to this and allow this to seep in, I think what I was saying here is you know, understandable. Then do the reading. The, the reading is atrocious, I know, and you're gonna not understand a lot of it. But some of it will ring true. But, but if you put the two together, I think you can uh, penetrate this uh, pretty well. It's gonna make more sense now. Uh, I, did, I, I chose this selection deliberately because we're gonna follow two, two sections. Um, two further developments of this section of Hegel's phenomenology from uh, as it finds itself in the economic and philosophical manuscripts of Karl Marx and also as it was um, used and reformed by Dubois who's one of the great phil philosophers of the uh, civil rights movement and his writings, uh, a little bit of his writings is in that anthology that I asked you to buy. So um, you can see how, uh, you can see how this passage found its way into these two great thinkers. Okay, all right.